Good evening. Welcome to the Tuesday, December 12th, Issaquah City Council Services and Safety Committee. And uh, uh, Eileen Barber will be joining us shortly. So we will get started. Uh, and I believe that we're going to start with uh, Senior Center Long Term Operations, Agenda Bill 7401. And it's going to be Jeff Watley, Director of Parks and Recreation for the city. Thank you, Councilmember Martz. Good evening, Jeff Watling, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. Just as you as you stated, I'm here again to talk about the the Senior Center. Um, I think for both you and our listening audience, I, I want to emphasize before I jump into this that this agenda bill and recommendation uh, does not represent a final decision as to the operation of the of the senior center, but it rather uh, seeks direction and, and really represents a motion uh, to pursue and explore uh, an operating partner as we move forward. So uh, with that, um, a quick overview of the, of the agenda bill itself and then um, open for, for Q&A and discussion. So throughout this year, um, beginning January of, of 2017, uh, hard to believe we're, we're nearing a, a full year here, the city's begun and has been the interim operator of uh, the Senior Center. Uh, this is through a, a, a lot of hard work of staff, uh, volunteers. Um, we have really set out um, uh, the goal to not only keep uh, that facility open as we as we pursue long-term operation, but really um, help to set that facility on um, a positive path and and the future that uh, is pretty clear this community wants for that for that facility. Um, as we've done that, uh, we also uh, really intended and set forth a goal uh, that as we're operating that facility um, in this mode, in this interim mode, um, it really is allowing for the needed time and the discussion uh, amongst the community. Uh, and, and with council uh, to really explore uh, that important policy decision of long-term operation and, and what we want that to look like um, and what we want that to be. Um, in March of this last year, uh, Mayor Butler um, initiated a senior center advisory group. Uh, that group spent uh, many months working um, and looking very intently at this question of long-term operation. Um, as you recall in September, um, of this year um, at Services and Safety Committee, that advisory group, group came and presented to you uh, their report um, on, um, on operation. Uh, it was a pleasure working with that group. Uh, some members of that, uh, that group are here tonight. Um, should you uh, seek any feedback or, or questions from, from them? Um, that group uh, and its work really represented two phases. Uh, the first phase was really a pretty in-depth information gathering and learning stage that took um, about three months, uh, April, May, and June. Uh, from there, we jumped into uh, some deliberation um, and really processing and developing uh, the recommendation um, and the report, the core of that report. Uh, that report, if you recall, um, uh, presented again a lot of the work and a lot of the, the research that, that uh, was done through that group, but really um, also led to um, six, the framing of six what we called guiding principles uh, that were really intended to become the framework um, and the foundation for um, operation, uh, current and long-term operation of the Senior Center. Uh, those guiding principles, um, to highlight those real quickly, one was um, transparency and oversight and how critical it is that that operation um, 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 have uh, transparency as a, as a core principle um, for um, its operation. Uh, partnerships and collaboration was another guiding principle and that is regardless of operator, thriving, vibrant senior centers um, um, happen and occur through multiple um, hands, multiple operators, multiple partners who are uh, providing services and support. Uh, another guiding principle was a, the cultural focus being customer service um, and customer service really being a, um, a, a core piece of um, the culture of that uh, facility. Uh, the fourth guiding principle was coordination with city facilities, understanding whether the city is the direct operator or we have an operating partner at that senior center, um, how that senior center, how that facility is able to more closely relate to our community center, um, our swimming pool, uh, the other facilities that we have that also provide services and programs for seniors. Uh, great opportunity for that synergy. 
Um, the fifth guiding principle was uh, really balancing this mix of programs and services. Um, recreation, lifelong learning type programs, but also um, a mix of um, social services, senior services, health services, um, and focus on um, our seniors um, and um, them aging well. Uh, the, the sixth guiding principle um, was around uh, just agility, innovation, and creativity, and making sure there's a culture, uh, there's an expectation that uh, that facility and the operator of that facility is, is constantly leaning forward and leaning in uh, to what um, is happening, uh, what best practices are, uh, what programs and services um, can continue, and how they can continue to be vibrant there at the facility. Um, those core elements um, from that report and um, as I talk about the recommendation tonight and that recommendation of um, the city um, exploring an operating partner, uh, those, those guiding principles really become foundational to um, our search for an operating partner. Um, as we put together a request for qualifications, a request for proposal, uh, those six guiding principles become key elements of not only that proposal, but also key elements in how we evaluate um, a partner and a prospective partner for, uh, for that facility. To the uh, recommendation itself, um, the recommendation as uh, you see in the agenda bill is just that, that, that we um, take this next year, um, jump into early 20, 2018 um, um, and pursue and explore finding an operating partner for that facility. Um, a lot of discussion went into that uh, decision, um, but understanding that for many decades that senior center um, has historically been operated um, by a nonprofit entity, um, understanding that uh, not only have we not been the operator, but uh, there are a number of agencies, <clears throat> both internal to Issaquah and within the region, uh, that are positioned and have experience um, in managing that senior center um, and the ability to, to deliver that mix of social services and recreation programs uh, that we felt um, it imperative to um, at least initially uh, pursue, go down this road of pursuing <clears throat> an operating partner. Um, it's the recommendation as well that um, in, uh, should we find that partner, uh, that we would uh, frame up this um, arrangement, this agreement through a management agreement, um, as opposed to uh, a lease agreement uh, that was the, uh, the, the previous model uh, uh, for the operator. So, um, in terms of timeline, uh, real quickly, what we are looking uh, to do um, pending uh, council approval uh, would be uh, sometime first quarter of next year, February and March, uh, we would um, get that request for qualifications, request for proposal. I, I kind of use both. I know in the agenda bill I wrote re request for proposal. In some ways I feel like as we pursue this partner, it's almost gonna be a hybrid of an RFQ and an RFP. RFQ being a, a typical model where we're really uh, researching, requesting, seeking qualifications from uh, interested partners, um, but also a, a request for proposal and that we are going to really be seeking um, any interested partners um, business proposal, uh, if you will, a work plan, a business plan of how they would intend uh, to operate that facility, what mix of programs and services would they be able to offer, what are they expecting the city uh, to do in, in terms of support. So um, in getting that advertised and put together um, um, and out in February and March, uh, we would anticipate uh, sometime April uh, of next year beginning the evaluation process uh, and the interview process allowing us um, in May of next year being the milestone uh, for uh, selecting um, a partner, uh, deciding if, if there is the partner out there and, and selecting them and beginning that negotiation process for the management agreement. Uh, that would allow us um, as, a, as our milestone goal to look at June of next year uh, to uh, begin, the, begin the council approval process uh, for that agreement. Um, with those milestones set and understanding um, at the same time, an operating partner would need their time to begin to staff up, queue up, 
uh, prepare, we would be anticipating a October, November of next year uh, transition period uh, to that operating partner um, as we uh, sort of begin this journey. Um, I'd wanna emphasize in this though, and as you certainly see um, alternatives as we continue to discuss this and explore this, um, and again, as this is not a final decision tonight, but it really represents that um, pursuit, that exploration of that partner. Um, as we go into any RFQ or RFP process, um, the option always exists for us to, um, if we don't find a partner, uh, we're back to the drawing board and we have the opportunity to explore what other models or options are out there. I say that in that this pursuit um, uh, does not drive us towards one single decision of, of what this um, operation might be long term. Um, there is as well um, a request for some additional funding um, as we're looking at our work plan next year within the department, as we're beginning to really scope out the work and the important work of this RFQ and RFP, uh, we think it's imperative that we um, get some additional um, expertise uh, through a professional services agreement. Um, the request is up to $25,000 just to give us some additional uh, resources uh, to assist us, aid us in uh, the development of this proposal, uh, the evaluation of this proposal, um, and the, the crafting and drafting of that, of that management agreement so um, given the the timing of this agenda bill and and the likely approval um, or this going back to City Council in January uh, we would anticipate this um, or, or seek the additional funding for this uh, that $25,000 as a um, future 2018 budget uh, adjustment amendment I should say <clears throat> so with that and the fact that my voice is getting froggy I will pause and uh, open up for any Q and A or discussion. So, so to be clear, that twenty five thousand will be in uh, Jen's list tomorrow. No, what we're today? saying is, given this won't even go to council till January, this would be a, a wouldn't be seen in the two thousand eighteen budget ad adoption. This would be seen as a uh, future amendment um, sometime next okay. year. But it would certainly could be your pleasure too if you wanted to fold this into. Um, and, and remind me, the 25,000 for professional services, what does that mean? Is that, I mean, when you say prof professional services, what do you mean specifically? This would be a consultant agreement. So this would be, you know, finding someone, partnering with someone uh, with direct senior services experience, direct experience in RFP, RFQ processes. Got it. Yep. Questions? Yes. Yes, <laughs> Yes, I have a question. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm just reading through and, and understanding. So um, in regard to the advisory committee and, and the five months of time that they that they put in talking about this, that really um, they, they didn't have a recommendation one way or another, that they saw pros and cons to both sides. Um, could you just talk a little bit sure. more about that and give me a little more detail? Sure, absolutely. And again, some of the members are here, so they can certainly speak to that as well. Of the 10 members, as we really began to look, and as you said, weigh the pros and cons, um, literally those 10 members span the spectrum of what is a preferred recommendation. So there was not um, uh, unanimous uh, consensus uh, as to what the best model would be. And so, um, as we looked at um, neighboring facilities, uh, other facilities in the area, as we looked at um, and weighed um, the advantages of what a third party operator might br bring to this operation versus what are some of the advantages when cities are direct operators, there were really um, advantages and disadvantages that went with all of them. Um, that discussion and that reality that this group really represented those that thought city operation was the better model and those that thought third party operation was the better model or an operating partner was a better model. It really led us to this common ground in realizing these guiding principles really become central. Uh, those six guiding pr principles that I spoke to mm -hmm. um, and I think where we reached 10 out of 10 unanimous consensus was, you know what, if those six guiding principles are achieved, regardless of the model, whether it's the city operating that way or whether it's a 
a partner operating that way, if those six guiding principles are met, uh, we're gonna have a successful facility. Just follow up question and then <clears throat> After that recommendation came through, then um, can you talk a little bit more about the decision making to uh, recommend the uh, going out for RFP, uh, RFQ? Yes, absolutely. The, the, the recommendation from administration to pursue a, um, an operating partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, again, with all of that uh, information from the report, uh, looking at and understanding what we as the city are currently, what we've historically done and been a direct provider of, uh, how we are currently positioned staffing wise, um, recognizing and seeing that there are, um, there are agencies that are positioned that have more experience, more direct experience of managing senior centers than we necessarily do as, a, as an agency, that it, uh, it seemed like of those two options, um, pursuing, exploring, finding an operating partner felt like the, the, um, the best of the two to pursue initially. So uh, thus the recommendation to, you know, in order to pursue that and to find that partner, um, initiating this type of process, an RFP, RFQ uh, process um, to find that partner um, seem to make the most sense. Um, as we look at some of the financial realities of where we're at, um, some of the other um, bigger picture um, decisions and discussions about what we want to be a direct provider of versus a um, indirect or uh, partnered uh, provider of in terms of services, uh, that, that's what really led to this recommendation. Thank you. Hey. Um, my questions have been answered. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, so what we're gonna do then is typically what we do on these agenda bills is uh, we ask questions of staff and when we have our questions answered, we open it to the public before we deliberate on it. So if any of the members of the public, uh, either the working group or anybody else who's here would like to come speak to us and take a couple of minutes, we would love to hear your thoughts. Um, or not. Right yes, okay. feel free to come on up to the microphone. If you care to share your name and your relationship to the city, that would be fine. And if not, that's fine too. Oh no, I'm happy to. Inez Peterson, I have moved to Enumclaw, but my heart's here in Issaquah. Um, I just have a couple of comments um, and no offense to anybody here, but there's always a lone wolf in every group and I'm the lone wolf on the advisory council. From the very first meeting, we were told that the city was just temporary. Well, what that translates to is we managers of the senior center already have our mind made up. So whether you decide whatever you decide doesn't matter because we want an operating partner. We don't want the city to be responsible. Of course, I was, I'm for the city having the, the guiding hand. So I felt that biasness. Um, it was excellent that it didn't really sway the group either way because they came back with no decision even though they had been subjected to this bias at every meeting. Uh, I wanna say about transparency, we asked all year for a budget, we never got it. I wanna say about transparency, I asked about grants, I never got the information. And I have a question about the grants because we know they have $5,000 from one and 10 from another. Why am I still buying the birthday cakes and the cream for the seniors? Uh, something's wrong with that picture. Not that I, I don't really mind that, but if the budget can't afford the birthday cakes, something's really wrong. Um, the the um, grant situation, I feel this year was a waste. We didn't really make any significant progress. And next year it's gonna be the same thing because if no decision is made till the beginning of the fourth quarter, the, the operating partner has to have a grant process in place. Most of these grants can be applied for only at one time of the year. And so I see that there'll be another year of the city's um, 
predominant financial support, it, even if you do decide to go with this operating partner paradigm. Uh, I, Buckley has contacted me. They have meals five days a week. Three come from Catholic Community Services, and the other two, they hire their own cook, and they love their own meals so much better than Catholic Community Services, but they were unaware of the Older Americans Act. And on my parting words, I just want to say, we haven't taken advantage of that. There's medical services, health services, transportation, and of course the meals for seniors. We can't ignore that opportunity, and our pipeline for that for the state is through the Council on Aging. So I hope that we don't, just because we're gonna have another year of decision making, that we're gonna miss that opportunity to try to get some of that federal money. And I hope it stays around regardless of who's president. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Would anyone else care to speak this evening? Fred Nystrom, Issaquah resident. <clears throat> I hadn't planned to say anything until I heard Inez. Um, I was also on the, the group and I never felt for a moment that there was any strong guidance in one, one way or the other in our deliberations. We started off <clears throat> with a, a group of people still reacting from the, the blow up of the senior center. So it was a thirst to have the city involved. But the more we talked and the more we looked at the pros and cons in a very open way, we ended up with about half and half, half looking for the rec what the recommendation is, and I was on that half, and and part we're holding on to the idea of, of the city running it and taking care of things. I thought that the process was lengthy, it was fair, it was above board, and I just wanted to, to put my sense in on the fact that um, there was not an ongoing bias. There was open conversations on both sides. We took good ideas on sticky tape and put them up on the walls. I mean, we, we were about as open as any organization, volunteer organization that I've ever participated in. So the record should, should note that. Um, I think the idea of going with an outside provider is, is excellent. It's gonna cost the city more money anyhow regardless of which direction we go. But, and, and as talked about the grants, the grants are gonna be very important in the future if you're gonna have additional funds coming in. And very few funding organizations wanna say, well, we'll take our hard-earned money that we've gathered together and we can give it to the city to cut down their expenses. Doesn't work that way very often. So I think we'll have an opportunity to go after grants in the future and whatever way it goes, I think it was a good, open, and fair process. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Would anyone else like to speak this evening? Council members, uh, David Wagoner, uh, 360 Northwest Dogwood Street, uh, relationship with the city since 1945. Um, I was not on the advisory board. I was simply uh, a senior that attended every meeting. And uh, I agree with what Fred said. I felt like it was a uh, fair, open. Uh, I can tell you after watching the deliberations that the members were totally uh, torn. Uh, between the two, there was no uh, one side or the other on which it should be, city run or um, a 501c3. Um, I agree with uh, Jeff on the RFQ and RFP process, but I've got to tell you, I think that we're way too soon to make that RFP decision. There are several factors out there that did not get discussed, and uh, the decision now is strictly not from the advisory board, but now from the city and um, administration's recommendations. 
One thing you have to keep in the back of your mind, because I have talked to a lot of seniors at the senior center, you have to consider what they want. It's not what the administration wants, it's what those seniors want and need. And I can tell you clearly uh, through many meetings that those seniors said, we love what the city has done for us in this past year, and we would like to see it continue. And I don't think there's anybody in this room that can deny those words that were said by those seniors in several different meetings. So before a decision is reached, council, I really think that you need to sit over there and listen to those seniors, okay? Some of them probably snore, but that's okay, because that's what we do after lunch. Um, <laughs> The important thing is that their voice be heard like mine's being heard tonight. In this country, we're so fortunate that we can come and talk openly and disagree with each other. We couldn't do that in the last senior center because there's one person standing in front of you. You know what happened when I started to open my mouth and it wasn't it wasn't what Issaquah is all about. Issaquah is bigger and better than that. There is no doubt in my mind that we will get to that. I've voiced that to Jeff many times. We'll get there. But I don't think we're at the RFP level. And I don't know that we want to reach out to anybody until we know what the qualifications are and what the qualities are that are out there to be bidding on an RFP. Let's use that 25,000 to uh, find out what an RFQ can do for us. And so as a couple of other council members said to me, let's make sure we do it right so we don't have to do it over again. The last experience that we had was not good, as we all know, and I'm not gonna rehash that. It was not good. We live in a community that's better than that, bigger than that. Let's make sure that we've got our act together and go out and research. And this year in the interim uh, time frame, you know that in the budget, because I saw it, it's there, that we've got five day a week meals, three, uh, two by uh, Catholic Community Services and three by the city. That was one of the things that the task force was Fred. That was one of the things the task force came out with, it was absolutely clear from the seniors they wanted that. The other one that was absolutely crystal clear, and Inez knows this, and that's transportation. They asked for transportation. All of those other recommendations are in this report. Please take time to read that. I know you get inundated with stuff you gotta read, but just take a few minutes to read those recommendations because they're powerful and they came from a great body of people. But listen to those seniors out there. They're the ones that you're taking care of. And remember, they built this community. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comments. Is there anyone else here today that would like to speak to us on this uh, agenda bill? Going twice? All right, that closes community feedback on this. Questions, thoughts? Yes, thoughts. This has been this has been an extremely long length of time to get here, but I think it sounds like everybody has come together and worked together, and I believe I'm feeling very comfortable with the outcome um, of what is being presented to us this evening and what um, we'll, we'll be able to see when we go over and visit the, the Senior Center, that it's gonna be back to a very uh, important, exciting place for seniors to spend their afternoons and their evenings, get their meals, their social life, and I'm excited to, I'm excited to come over and have lunch. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for, for that. <laughs> Thanks, Eileen. Mariah? So, Jeff, I, I have a, one or two more questions. Um, in regard to um, finding an operating partner, 
If this, uh, what role would the city still have with an operating partner and what sort of um, uh, agreements would be put in place to make sure that we didn't experience some of the problems that we had in the past? And how would, is, has there been thought around how that could be structured in regard to the operating agreement that would come forward? I know we've got some high level, um, really great sort of almost like a vision, you know, mm -hmm. vision statement, that's great. Um, but the specifics of how that would work so we didn't go down the same road, I'd just like to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think I think lessons learned is an important one. Um, the, the framework that we would be looking at would be a management agreement as opposed to a lease agreement. A management agreement would give the city and recognize the city as the owner of that facility. Um, um, much more, um, uh, I don't know, a, a more, it, it really represents a more partnered position as opposed to a, a tenant owner relationship that a lease agreement does. Um, I don't have a, a, a model in front of me, but there are a lot of models that we would certainly want to build from in terms of uh, effective public management agreements. Um, um, I think some of the key elements of um, oversight of um, the relationship of that um, operating group's board and um, what role um, or opportunity the city might have in that is one way um, uh, that relationship um, may be strengthened. Um, I think a management agreement would also recognize um, more clearly expectations and performance um, measures, uh, performance metrics that would be expected to be met. Um, um, it just, it, al it allows, and I guess in a, a real simple way, maybe an oversimplified way, I apologize if it is, um, it recognizes the importance of the relationship and that it's a partnership. Um, and it's, again, not such a, sometimes a lease agreement can feel like more of a hands-off um, here, you go ahead and do it, we'll be over here. Uh, this is more of a, a framework that's really expected to say, hey, as the owner of the facility and as you, the operator of the facility, we've, we're gonna do this together and we're gonna do it together um, in a much more relationship-focused way. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Not right this second. Right? Not right this second. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think that one of the things you spoke to uh, was about the public process beyond this. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really clear that both uh, this committee today and then if this bill goes back uh, and gets support out of the full council, you know, this is not the end of the public engagement process. And so I think that uh, I'm very confident that these uh, uh, what do they call governing, not governing principles, uh, the guiding okay. principles, I think will inform the RFP uh, very well and will inform our, our response to that. Uh, but there's still, uh, there's still a big decision in front of the city uh, before they pull the final trigger on that. So this is, what did Churchill say? This is not the beginning of the end, but this is perhaps the end of the beginning. Right. So, um, so I, I support this, and I support it obviously going back to full council, regular business, not uh, not consent. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mariah, Sorry. another question. Um, so uh, when I'm, I'm looking at the timeline, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there, Jeff, wondering if um, I, I agree, Tola, that, that, that this would not be the, um, you know, stopping further mm -hmm. feedback from um, everyone at the senior center. Um, it, it looks like the transition to the operating partner would be October, November. I'm wondering if there's a way to, um, to add in some more engagement with the seniors uh, at the very beginning of the process, um, maybe early January, maybe um, through our, uh, you know, with our neighborhood um, engagement um, uh, person and, and maybe to have um, even just more feedback to council. Um, but uh, 
Short of that, I would I would say that um, if if we were going to go forward, this was going to come to council. I would uh, love to see um, information sent out to the senior center so we we could have um, more feedback um, come in. Mm -hmm. I'd just really like to hear from from the people at the senior center mm -hmm. of, about how they're feeling. But uh, but overall, I. Um, uh, I would. I'm, this has been a really long process. It's been um, something near and dear to my heart to um, make sure that we get back on um, on a great footing with the senior center, and we've and we've made such great strides. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand um, what's in front of us and see that as something that that could definitely be workable. Um, love to have a little more feedback from the seniors um, and. Uh, and I, the the management agreement um, that we just talked about, I think is just absolutely critical, and that that's um, constructed in a way uh, that really thinks through and works through some of the problems from the past, and make sure that that there wouldn't be um, bandwidth for that, mm -hmm. you know, to come about it, um, in the future. So I'm. I'm very supportive of this and supportive of it um, coming back before full council on regular business. But I, I, I'm, I asked a question and then I kept talking. Sorry. I did that the other night. There was a question in there. To, um, <clears throat> just in terms of, do you think we would have public the time process. to get a little more of the public process? Absolutely. Y yes. Um, <clears throat> again, as operators and as staff that are committed to those seniors and committed to getting this right, uh, yeah, I think there's a number of vehicles and, and mechanisms that we can continue the engagement. Um, uh, be it January, I think an opportunity to lay out what this process is, uh, to inform the group, uh, continue to get feedback on um, what that RFQ looks like. I think there's a number of touch points along this way that we can make sure that um, we're getting some feedback from seniors and also informing them um, of what's happening with the, with the process. Yeah. Even if we could set up a meeting and allow council to attend that meeting sure. so we could hear the feedback just in the very beginning like of the that. process, yeah. I think that would be great. Okay. So that would be Can my recommendation. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh, the challenge is going to be that we've got a lot, um, well, we have a lot going on in January, right? We because we've got uh, the... We're finishing the budget this month, but uh, council leadership and the appointment of the open seat, um, and we're suggesting another council meeting in January. No, not another council meeting. I was suggesting that um, Lasan. Oh, uh, Lisa. Yeah. Lisa, or if we were I'm to host sorry. something at the senior center, perhaps. And get some feedback. Mm -hmm. um, uh, council uh, okay. members could no, attend um, or not, or not mm -hmm. and right. then we could get feedback. Now I understand. Okay. Um, I just think that would be a great idea. Understood. And you're nodding your head yes, that that seems could, like a reasonable we can, thing. We can build that into okay. the schedule. Yep. Great. Yeah, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Other questions? Eileen? No, not to me. All right. So the motion is mm -hmm. to move Agenda Bill 7401 to the December 12th, 20, well, Council Service Review. Returning to the full council on or before January 23rd, 2017. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. 3-0. It just says honor before January 23rd. That's what the that's what the administration's recommendation is. So that's what we move. Okay. Obviously, probably the 23rd if you're going to put a meeting with Ethan in there in the midst. Yeah. We'll All right. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to move to Agenda Bill 7493. Also, Jeff, uh, Lake Sammamish State Park Partnering Agreement. And I'm back. All right. Thank you. Um, this item might be a, a little quicker. Um, as you are aware, and as I understand from a conversation that happened at the last council meeting, um, the city is um, interested and is has been in conversations with uh, Lake Sammamish State Park or State Park, Washington State Parks, um, on um, putting together an EIS process for Lake Sammamish State Park. Uh, Keith Niven um, has been my partner in crime in this effort. Um, um, 
And Nikki Fields is here from Washington State Parks. Um, rather than go through the whole EIS process, um, what I was hoping to do, at, at least as a staff report, is um, um, address some of the additional questions I understand were asked um, at, the, at the meeting, and those questions were really raised and, and uh, wanted some clarification or confirmation on our park, park strategic plan process and um, how our park strategic plan, forgive me, uh, relates to uh, this work uh, that's being intended at, at Lake Sammamish State Park. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer that in a couple of ways. Uh, first, as the park plan is nearing completion, um, it is very clear and very evident that um, our park system, the city of Issaquah's park system, as we begin to envision that park system um, and look into the future and how we um, uh, really create a compelling, connected park system, how we relate not only to Lake Sammamish State Park, but the other public properties around us is really an, a key element um, of this park plan. So. Um, it is very clear uh, that um, the, the park plan is going to uh, speak to and seek this desire to enhance this relationship between Lake Sammamish State Park um, and the rest of the city's system. Um, first way that's going to be reflected in the strategic plan, and, and we're really working hard and fast in getting that document completed. We're probably a, a month away from um, having a, a draft document out to the community uh, to begin uh, responding to and communicating it to it, uh, uh, commenting back to us on it. Um, it's pretty clear uh, both in the vision statement of the document that's gonna weave throughout this. Um, the vision for uh, Issaquah's park system as we've taken all this public feedback in is really twofold. Um, and I think it's a unique opportunity throughout the Puget Sound region in this way. Um, first uh, part of the vision is how do we create a compelling, um, diverse, high quality park system within the city of Issaquah that serves our residents and the diverse needs and interests of our residents, not only in terms of activities, but connecting to nature. Uh, so in a way, it's, it's the vision of a, a quality system within the city of Issaquah, um, while at the same time being that system being a gateway um, into the public lands and the outdoor recreation that surrounds us. So it's really this most inside outside vision. Um, this map that I have up um, is an early, relatively early, this is about September, um, as we began to take all the public feedback um, and take all the site work and the, the groundwork we were doing with our consultant teams and started to pull together uh, what ends up being just over 40 strategic projects uh, that really have become the, the, um, the baseline for um, the strategic projects and strategic vision of this looking out 20 years. Um, I, I bring this and, and I, I point this out because, um, and I don't know if this cursor really shows, um, maybe I'll go to it real quick. A very a strong, compelling piece of Issaquah's park system uh, when you look at what's been acquired and then when you look, when this plan looks at the opportunities that we have in front of us, um, there's a strong, compelling anchor element that is this north-south, um, what we're calling a spine. I, I, I hope that term is actually rephrased as the community begins to own this, but you see a spine of the system that runs from Squawk Valley Park to our south border along Issaquah Creek, along the Rainier Corridor, so many of our existing parks are along it, up to the lake and Lake Sammamish State Park. Um, I, I just mention this visual and point this out because it's just another way of reinforcing, that's gonna be clear, our relationship, the residents, our city system's relationship to Lake Sammamish State Park is gonna be instrumental um, in the vision moving forward. And so as we've worked with state parks and, and uh, Development Services Department, this EIS process uh, we feel is gonna be extremely complementary uh, to the park strategic plan um, and the vision we have for the, the system. So um, with that, uh, any questions, thoughts, comments? Are with questions? Helene? Mm -hmm. Brian? Right. Okay. So what this doesn't directly show is uh, sort of specificity around uh, 
There's going to be interconnects into the park system, correct? Right for both for pedestrian for what? How do we envision um, spine, if you will, uh, con connecting to the park? I think first and foremost, it's a it's a greenway that's going to have a clear non-motorized pedestrian trail connection, uh, and and hopefully, I think as the trail planning work happens within the state, I think it's not going to be just one core. I think we would see opportunities in how to make pedestrian connections not only from the east and East Lake Sammamish Trail, uh, but from sort of the central spine where Pickering Barn is. Um, also, how do we make pedestrian connections um, on the more western part of, of the state park? So uh, you're right, those specifics, I think, begin to take shape and take form. They're not really specifically represented on this map. So uh, strong pedestrian connections into the into the park. Uh, I think vehicular connections and where ultimately that um, uh, vehicle entrance into the state park is going to be something that's going to be explored in the EIS as well. What do the uh, pink arrows mean? <laughs> I love it. I knew this was a, a risk of putting the map up. So the pink arrows are, again, a very early um, illustration of a desire to create some um, pedestrian um, connections over I-90. Um, you know, as we part of the part of the work of this of this effort, not only with public engagement, is let's accept and be practical about some of the barriers that exist in Issaquah. Um, I-90 is a it's a physical barrier. So, um, you've got Lake Tradition to Central Park. Does that mean uh, a pedestrian recreation of the old uh, train trestle that went across at altitude? Because Tradition uh, Lake Tradition is at altitude, and Central Park yes, is at is. altitude. Uh, we do not have specifics yet, so this is this is this represents the visionary part of this document. How and where those actual connections happen? Um, as long as somebody can find to. grant money for it, yeah, <laughs> it would be an interesting homage to uh, to the city's history. Yeah, well, yeah, I think I think the pink arrows really represent also the the I think the practical reality of the strategic plan. There are going to be cer certain elements, certain projects. Um, the compelling parks component is probably what's going to lead that capital investment. In some of these cases, as we set the vision for these projects, um, and let's use an I-90 crossing as, as an example, perhaps the pedestrian component of that isn't going to lead that project. Perhaps uh, as Sound Transit is being envisioned or where that connection is going to be might be the lead of that capital project. Now, how do we make sure that pedestrian con connection becomes an element of, of that work? Um, this, this plan might represent it getting accomplished that way as well. And does the red line look like a snake that swallowed a gazelle because you <laughs> don't really know where, that's the John Wayne, is that? Yeah, that is the Mountains to Sound Greenway Trail on the vision. Uh, for and is it, does it look like it swallowed a gazelle because yeah. you don't really know where that yes. trail in particular yes. is going to cross I-90? Yep. Uh, where it's going to cross and it also represents some of the, the future planning and work with uh, Central Issaquah Plan and sort of how and where that actual corridor happens is still some future planning. And then you mentioned uh, in the next month or so uh, the draft of the Parks Recreation Open Space Trail. I heard from uh, I heard from a little <laughs> bug told me that uh, that was going to be actually before the end of the month. The first draft was going to be out to uh, not to council, but. To community or that, some in the community they would see it before the end of the year that that remains a goal we are meeting with the park board as, as we're ever changing and ever moving forward we're meeting with the park board next week in fact and taking one of our sort of last lifts uh, before that draft is formed is um, taking this list of long-term projects and if you took a look at the survey we gave to the community just last month we got some great feedback on these projects we're actually uh, next Tuesday night with park board um, running, we've set up some criteria and a scoring matrix that we're gonna run all of these projects through to identify what our near-term, mid-term, and long-term investment um, priorities are. And so um, as that unfolds on Tuesday, um, public is welcome to the park board meeting. Um, as the timing of getting that final draft done, it's either gonna be the end of this month or, or very early in January. Got it. Yep. Other questions? Um. 
the entrance now is going to be moving? Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, I don't know that that's been a final decision. I think it's final. being considered and explored. It is being considered. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Nikki Fields from State Parks. So um, we are considering moving the entrance. There are a few problems with the current entrance. Uh, one, it isn't very visible. Um, another is something I described at a meeting last night is as you're, as you're driving toward the entrance, have you had this experience where it's like, oh, is this it? No, that's the house. Oh, here, no, that's the shops. Finally, here's the entrance. And so there, there's that kind of issue and also the, um, the current entrance and Tibbetts Creek aren't playing very well together. So as uh, beavers use the creek and build dams, that has caused flooding onto our entrance road. And so we've had to uh, work through those kind of issues in the past. So if we were able to move it to another location, it may solve both this uh, visibility and, and wayfinding problem, um, but also could provide opportunities for doing restoration work at Tibbetts Creek. And that brings us back to the the um, vision that we had for Lake Sammamish State Park that was uh, displayed in our 2007 master plan for the park. And that was one of um, a, a melding of recreation and restoration within this park. <clears throat> and that the park was really a, a place to connect people to the natural world. And um, I think that being able to do that kind of restoration on Tibbetts Creek would um, be totally within the goals that we have had since that plan first came. I have a question, um, and I don't really know who it's for, but I'll ask you. Uh, so, uh, you know, at the southeast corner of the state park are the soccer fields. And uh, one of the things it seems like, if you move the entrance, I don't know how exactly this would work, but if it, if it moved back somewhat, but not all the way back by the soccer fields, you could conceivably have, instead of having an entrance for the soccer fields, that's like four inches from the intersection of uh, 56th and 12th, uh, but you, know, you could have something a little further away, and then that would, that would have huge benefits on, because I find actually, I find exit 15 is at the worst not at five o'clock at night when you try to go home. It's actually 12 noon on a Saturday or 11 a.m. on a Saturday and you're trying to get across and the soccer folks are going in and out of those fields. So it seems like if this is done right, it could benefit the state park and benefit the city for, for helping clear up the, uh, that intersection a little bit. Is that something that we're looking at, Jeff? Yeah. yeah good. Yeah, I think it's those programmatic elements that and how we sort of mesh, um, um, address some of the historical issues and um, find a way to um, sort of complement recreational use and the rest of the state park um, in a better way. Yeah. Questions? Mariah, right. I know you have one. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I just, I'm looking at the agenda bill and, and um, I, I guess we just don't have everything that happened in there or the updates. So it says that this came before land and shore on November 2nd. Um, sorry, just one second. And then uh, came to council on December 4th, um, and then we just don't have anything after that. So I just wanted to, could you just give a little snapshot of that? Sure. I'm gonna, Keith used this word at, at the Land and Shore meeting. I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna phone a friend and invite okay. Keith Niven to come up and talk uh, what's next after this. Um, so we haven't updated the agenda bill since the December 4th council meeting um, because the next update will be after this committee meeting. So we'll do an update based on the conversation that comes out of this meeting for the 18th. We're assuming that this committee sends it back to full council for um, action. And I think we might have talked to... Um, touched on um, the the questions that came during that meeting, but um, uh, I'm not sure we co covered all of them. So just wanted to ask that. So questions that came from council. 
Um, so the questions, I might need to go back and watch. That was a, um, that was a, a heavy council meeting. What I remember was the questions about the budget allocation and I think Council Member Ramos uh, asked the question why if we're, if we're going through budget right now and there's an ask for a partnering agreement with state parks, um, why not go ahead and put that into the proposed 2018 budget as opposed to calling it out as a separate um, budget adjustment next year. So that, um, so the administration heard that question and I think what you're gonna see on the deliberation list tomorrow night is this item will be listed as one of the things uh, to potentially include in the budget for uh, next year as opposed to having it a separate uh, mid-year budget adjustment. So that question I think um, we're tracking on. Um, I'm not sure I remember other questions, Mariah? Uh, so in terms of the just having the whole park strategic plan, I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but I, I thought that one of the questions uh, was around just the timing. So, so, so I believe I was the originator of that okay. question. Okay. And it was really, that's why we're having this conversation that's now. That's why we've got I what said, we, um, I just I, wanna make yeah. sure we covered the questions that Yep. Did yeah. come up? I, I was aware, I wasn't suggesting we, that we wait until the council gets the parks, recreation, open space, trails plan, but rather have this conversation so I could understand, I just, for my own benefit, how, because it's so important, I think, the, the green necklace, that I wanted right. to know that before we moved forward with this. Right. Okay. That. I think that was all. I, I think what would be more helpful to me, I know we, we're, we're updating and updating, especially when something comes to council, then it gets sent back. But if it's at council, then it comes back to committee um, to have the update of why and then the questions that came from council so we can make sure we cover all of those before we go back to council again. Just, that would Good be point. helpful Sorry for me. about that. Yeah. No, that's... That's and I think staff generally endeavors to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why Jeff presented this. Yeah, no, that's great. The way he did. He chatted about it before. The, okay. I, I was aware that he was going to be presenting this. Okay. So, uh, with that, uh, public comment. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> sure. So, um, just um, talking about the the timing on the state from the state parks perspective, is state parks currently has funding to begin work on an EIS. We don't have enough funding to complete work on an EIS, so we're currently juggling whether to start work with right now without knowing whether we'll be able to finish. We do have pressures um, both internally and externally. So we um, are being uh, approached fairly often by new advocates for things that could go in the park. And it seems like every couple weeks there's a new proposal and we keep telling them, hold off, we're going to start this planning process and, and figure out uh, what should be in the park and what should not be. And so there are the advocates for each of those proposals that are, that are sort of waiting and then internally, um, We've got this money that isn't being spent right now and we have people that are about to be laid off because the state doesn't have a capital budget. And so our, our budget folks are looking at what we should be spending money at. I'm not saying it's gonna go away right away, um, but I think eventually if, um, if, it, if we don't start work on this, we may need to decide whether we're gonna keep that money held for Lake Sammamish or whether we need to use it for something else. So. Um, those are the, the timeline pressures that State Parks is considering right now. Can I ask me a question? So what is that timeline? I mean, we don't want to, we've, it's been a very long time in coming to get something done here and I don't want to lose any of it. So what is that timeline that we need to begin to show the state that we are definitely moving forward with this and it's an important project for us in our community? I think what we've been saying is is early 2018. Um, that is a little Sorry. loose, <laughs> um, but but we've been telling the public and telling the advocates for these projects and telling our budget office, telling everybody in early 2018, we'll know whether we're moving forward on this. So I I think that that would be sufficient for us. It's 
Um, if, if it looks like it's moving, but at a slightly slower pace, we, we could probably continue talking like that, but I, that is what people's expectation is right now. So moving this agenda bill forward, is that a beginning sign that we are definitely, okay, and, yeah. then, you, and then what would be the next steps after that to make sure we're staying on course? Well, um, if the the council does uh, approve it at at the next meeting, then I think that everybody is happy and and um, and will be ready to start work uh, pretty soon on on this planning effort to figure out what should be in the park and then to look at the environmental implications of that, um, which I think is really important. Um, if if it takes longer than that, I, I think just. Um, continuing the conversations and make sure that everybody understands that that we're working through it. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Right. Um, well, one question. <laughs> yeah. So it, uh, Jeff, um, uh, just the, the traffic evaluation would, I, I know we already talked about the entrance um, change, what else would, or Keith, <laughs> um, what the traffic evaluation, I, I'm just trying to remember what else that would encompass. Sure, so, um, so there's a lot of competing interests with the desire to move the entrance, right? I think from a park usability standpoint, it's clear why they would like to move the entrance closer and to a more prominent location. Um, as we move that entrance closer to, um, so what the money is covering is it would go to CH2M Hill who does the city's traffic modeling. And what they would do would be to see how close they could move that entrance to the intersection of 56th and 12th um, before it breaks. Um, and, you know, that could result in a lot of information that, that then parks could decide what they want to do with that. For example, if you take it all the way to the intersection and create like a five-legged intersection, it, you know, could you still keep the same level of service of traffic movement through that intersection, and if so, what kind of improvements would be necessary? Um, you know, it was mentioned earlier the, the, by Council Member Martz, the, the driveway for the Issaquah soccer, you know, so you've got that driveway and you've got the main entrance, and you know, if you bring it closer to the intersection, um, I think ultimately what it's going to do is, is it's going to generate, it's going to it's going to test the tolerance of, of our traffic operations is what it's going to do. And so what we'll learn from that is where can it be located and then what kind of traffic improvements would be necessary um, to generate a certain number of trips. And then from that, so I look at that as driving a lot of the conversation of what can happen in the park, other than the natural habitat and riparian corridor stuff. Obviously, that's not generating any, any, any trips, right? But as they would like to talk about other uses, and whether it's with Issaquah Soccer or REI or other partners, you know, any activity within the park is going to generate a certain number of trips. And I think what the EIS would do, um, and we would have to scope about the, the, what the EIS will cover, but traffic will be one, obviously. And what I see coming out of that process is here's a certain number of trips that state parks has and can allocate to different activity uses, but then they can choose the, from a, kind of a, a list of things that they might want to do in the park, and as long as they don't go beyond that number of trips, then the, whatever mitigation that comes out of this traffic analysis would cover that. So it would give them the flexibility of programming future things for the park and having the predictability of what kind of traffic improvement requirements would be necessary. That out, thank okay, you. Okay, sure. All right, so uh, with that, we'll ask if there's other public comment. Um, I have sort of a different view of EISs and development agreements because I've been through, I don't know, six. So um, 
I want to know if State Park is the lead agency for the EIS. I want to know the public involvement for the scoping because I think we, the community, at large needs to understand what the EIS is going to cover and decide with whether that is appropriate or non-appropriate. And I haven't seen that sort of a schedule of events at this point in time. Uh, and that could take a while. Last time we did that, it took years, two years, I think. So hopefully it wouldn't take that long. Realizing that the vast majority of the park is sensitive area and its buffer, and you do an EIS because you are going to be creating potentially immitigable impacts, and you're gonna to have to accept those. Um, I, I think that this has to be a super strong document realizing that all of these critical areas are going to be changing over time. So when we then migrate to a development agreement, then we also have to be looking at how long that development agreement should last, and I don't like these development agreements, uh, and we don't have a strong SEPA person except for the director of a department in our town right now. And so I'm, I'm sort of at a loss as how we're gonna get a good uh, document without without a very strong SEPA person protecting the interests of the town and the state park. Because I don't want to have to be screaming and shouting every time they start impacting some of my critical areas. So these are things that I see as deficits and future problems in the process that I would actually like to have ironed out uh, in, the, in, in the first two months with the scoping and I would like to have that scoping come back to council so that it can be part of the public process and understanding of the interconnection with the state park. I have so much more, but I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to this issue? Hi, I'm Debbie Berto, and I'm a board member with Friends of Lake Sammamish State Park. And I just wanted to fill you in on a little bit of, certainly we're encouraging this, but something that we've been working on for the last year and are continuing to work on is trying to find some extra capital funding in the state to do a pre-design report, which is really another term for updating the master plan. Because as Nikki said, there are a lot of other projects that have come forward that may have potential and need to be looked at and as Connie said it took a long time before but also would bring us some new cost estimates on all the different components that are in the master plan having all that information from the pre-design report of the update of the master plan at the same time as the EIS would just help us so much, then we would be able to come up with what's phase one, phase two, phase three in funding from the state future capital projects. So, and right now without a pre-design report, we can't get more than five million at a time. Instead we go in and piecemeal one, two, and three million We'd like when the, all this work gets done to really be able to go to the state and say, we're ready, we've done our homework, here's what we're looking at and we need some big bucks for the next round or two. So wanted you to know we're, we're working on that aspect of it and uh, excited to see this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wishing to speak to this issue? Anyone else? Going twice? No. All right, thoughts, Eileen? Do you need to have the recommendation? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, one second here, let me go to it. Uh, the administration recommendation is to uh, return to full council on December 18th, so quickly. Um, I'm excited for it to move forward. <laughs> I, I want to ask around this question about identifying the public input on next steps. And uh, there was public comment on uh, scoping and uh, wh how the public can be involved as we go forward. Can the administration plan on uh, presenting the notional uh, engagement schedule uh, at, at the 18th as part of the full council? 
You look quizzical. No. Yeah, no. Okay. No. Um, so clearly, work needs to be done to figure out um, how that wants to unfold. Um, I think we need to have some conversations with state parks. You know, this was, um, I think this was a big lift to ask y'all to kick in, you know, $252,000. $252,000, um, and until you guys say yes and please work on a development agreement, we have not, I've not spent more than, well, I spent an hour waiting to talk about this last time, but I, we haven't really talked about this. So I think what would happen is if you guys approve this agenda bill, um, it sends the signal both to state parks and the administration that we need to sit down and start planning out those next steps, um, and that would be something that, you know, if the council wants uh, some sort of a schedule, because this is a significant work item, um, I think maybe as part of the recommendation, if you would like to see that come back as a separate AB just to present the schedule and the community outreach, um, we could probably do that sometime in January. Okay. Does that sound like yeah? A good I mean, I think I just think there's going to be a lot of interest in the community, and I think uh, you know the sooner that we can tell the public how this is going to move forward and and how they can give us their thoughts, the the happier people are going to be. And if you tell me that's January, then that's January. But I I think we want to at least tell people on the 18th that we're going to come back in January and talk a little bit more about the public process. We can do that. Jeff's nodding his head as well. All right, thanks. Mariah? So thank you, Tola. That, that was uh, my question as well, and so that sounds great. Um, I, I would like to see that happen in January, and this is exciting, and, and uh, uh, we have a little more, you know, more work to do and more to understand about it, but like to see it moving forward. Um, but um, having that that public feedback and looking at the scoping and that kind of thing I think is really important. Excellent. Um, I'm wondering if I looked at the wrong recommendation. <laughs> I think I may have looked at the wrong recommendation. I may have looked at the next one. Uh, we'd be moving to... Authorize the mayor. Yeah, but the, I mean, we're not doing that tonight. We're. This is because this bill hasn't been updated, but we're just we're we're sending it back for the 18th, right? Was right. I, was I in fact correct when I so, said the 18th? Yeah. So so right now that bill has a current recommendation from Land and Shore, and I think procedurally, what I don't know, and if Bob wants to weigh in, I'd be more than happy. Well, to that recommendation is December 4th, which doesn't seem to work very well. Uh, so the so a new recommendation coming from Services seems like it potentially takes precedent over Land and Shore's recommendation. Recommendation. So, so if y'all want to make a recommendation, which would include coming back with a new AB in January, scoping out the work plan and the public outreach process, that might be what I've heard so far. So not coming back? On, no, we still want to come back on the 18th this is to a, full, get the full council's approval of $252,000. To authorize, <laughs> excuse me, the mayor to enter into the partnering agreement and to direct the administration to move forward with working on a development agreement with state parks. Right. So that piece is is what we're looking for clarity from the full council on. Right. Um, the, the extra little frosting for the, the separate AB would, would be the add-on. On, I think to the current motion. I trust the administration can write this all up in a coherent recommendation, but it sounds like right. absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> so I, I'm just looking back um, at, at at the AB and the update from Land and Shore, um, and just sort of I asked this question earlier and missed it myself. Um, what the committee, what Land and Shore had talked about before that came on uh, December 4th was the use of mitigation funds, shared parking opportunities, urban edges, and potential community outreach. I think we've talked about potential community outreach. Um, I just didn't know if um, the shared parking opportunities, the urban edges, and the use of mitigation funds is something we need to discuss further, if that was answered. Um, and that might be some of the material that council is expecting. Um, so, wait, I, sorry. so those, so those topical issues, I think, 
would be part of what would be considered in the development agreement um, as we start to work with state parks on what the development agreement includes. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, it could include discussion about shared parking, or it could include some conversation about um, creating a more urban edge to the state park that would maybe feel more like, and this is kind of, I think, what Jeff said at Land and Shore, would feel maybe a little bit more like it's uh, almost a, an extension of the city park system as opposed to the state park system and if that is indeed the case and functions that way, do we enter into a management agreement for maybe a portion of the property? That's all conversations that would need to happen as part of the development agreement process with state parks to potentially include that. I think what we would need to do is to, you know, because those issues were raised, I think among other things, put those on the table for conversation points, um, not only with the community, but also between the two parties of the development agreement. So I don't know that we would have any insights into those by the 18th because those conversations haven't even begun yet. But to document that so that could go forward in conversation. Okay. Absolutely. I just want to make sure I was understanding what I was reading. Yeah. So, thank you. All right. Eileen, anything else? Uh, no, I'm ready to move forward. Good. Okay, it sounds like we're through to O to bring it back on the 18th with the uh, additional language about coming back in January with the public engagement piece. And I'm, I'm excited about this. I think this is something council's been excited about for a long time. It's nice that you get to be part of that vote before you uh, <laughs> yes. leave council because you've been so instrumental well, in this I've conversation. Since I've been working with Nikki for a long time in the very first degree now. Yeah. So. so it's nice and we're putting our money where our mouth is. We'll talk right. about that tomorrow night. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next we will uh, go to Agenda Bill 7508, which is personnel policy manual changes resulting from state sick leave requirements. And this is Lori Brown, our Director of Human Resources. Uh, yeah, you can feel free to sit at the table. Okay. Okay. Just, oh, okay. Something unrelated to the city, but good yes. news at okay. the national okay. level. <laughs> Um, so we're here tonight to talk about the uh, paid sick leave policy, and this is res or, uh, RCW 1433. Um, on December 4th, we asked you to approve a resolution uh, that expresses city support for the new state sick leave policy um, and would adopt a sick leave policy for the city that complies uh, with the state code. So in summary, the effective date for the state law is going to be January 1st, 2018. Um, it we requires one hour of sick leave for every 40 hours worked. So for the city, what that means is it will apply to all non-exempt positions, including our part-time non-regular. Those employees currently do not receive sick leave, so we'll be adding sick leave banks for those employees. Um, it expands the definition of family, uh, uh, particularly for parent and child. Uh, it limits the ability to request verification for use of sick leave, and it will prohibit us from taking adverse actions against employees for using their sick leave. Um, the policy statement that we've asked you to approve, um, so a couple statements, I guess a couple of points about that policy statement. It does mirror the model policy that's been recommended by the state, so we use that as a template. Um, so we took that policy and incorporated our current sick leave policy into, the, into what the state is recommending. Um, also, uh, it, we tried with that policy to comply with the sick leave law, the state law, but not to, uh, to minimize the financial impact. So we've tried to comply, but not go beyond what the state is requiring us to do. The, uh, the new policy that we're proposing will extend sick leave to part-time non-regular, which I've mentioned before, so they will now have a sick leave bank. 
It will expand the definitions of parent and child. Um, and it will change the verification process that you need to go through for use when, when you're using sick leave. For administrative reasons, the definitions and the verification process will be extended not only to non-exempt employees, but also to exempt as well, so that we don't have two sets of, of definitions under which employees are using sick leave. Um, it also will disallow sick leave incentives, so the calculation that we use for the wellness days off and the uh, sick leave incentive days will um, no longer be allowed. We'll need to make some changes there. The policy changes, uh, all of, all of the, the new policy and any changes that need to be made, must they'll, they'll need to be negotiated so uh, they are subject to collective bargaining and we will be negotiating any of those changes and bringing those back to you. Any questions? <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, it seems this is clearly uh, uh, our good faith attempts to get uh, squared with the law that's out there. So this isn't okay. one of those ones you've got a lot of latitude with, but questions? Uh, so uh, thanks, Lori, for uh, the overview. And um, so it, it would um, extend to part-time regular. Um, I'm not sure of all the definitions that you have of people that are not um, full-time. Okay, so you have part-time regular, what are the long-term? Okay, so regular would be the long-term. Okay. <laughs> regular employees. Okay. Uh, part-time non-regular. Okay. Are the employees who currently don't have sick leave. They, they don't Great. have benefits at all. Okay. And then anything beyond that? Because I know you have other definitions of people that are we do temporary uh, or yeah we seasonal. use limited term limited use that term. as a status That's what I, i'm sorry yeah. i just for the life yeah. of me i could not pull that out yeah. um, so we can we can have part-time regular positions and those employees would have benefits right and then we have limited term and those employees are actually in ftes on a limited term basis okay okay and also have benefits Go ahead, I might have another question here. Eileen? This is where having an HR professional on council <laughs> as opposed to a mechanical engineer is helpful. <laughs> so um, it, I'm just trying to uh, look through again the um, just conversion, cash out. So basically you followed the state policy um, and it sounds like also anything in regard to wellness, uh, that kind of thing, that's all gone away, so you'll be changing those policies? We'll need to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the law, you'll see the last, uh, the last section of the new policy uh, prohibits, a, a, you know, um, of yeah. incentive. Disallows too. incentives like okay. that. Okay. It seems very straightforward and you're yeah. following the state policy and morphing all of your policies into that. So yeah. that yeah. makes really good sense to me. Okay. All right, so is this coming back uh, three to O on consent to full council on the 18th? Yes. All right. Okay, great, thank you. Teresa, you got that? All right, thank you. Uh, last but not least, this evening we have Agenda Bill 7519, E-City Gov Alliance Interlocal Agreement with our own Bob Harrison City Administrator. By the way, I want to I want to say staff who was has been exactly right about how long each of these pieces has taken us. We're we're within one minute of where we projected to be. So, nice job. It's good leadership. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> clearly, that's clearly what it's got to be the leadership. <laughs> and with that, Bob. Thank you. So um, of leadership. We are um, part of the eGov Alliance. It's been around since the uh, mid 1990s and. Um, they provide several uh, uh, programs for us, the most notable being mybuildingpermit.com, which allows for uh, online building submittals. Um, they've also had a history of uh, other programs. Uh, so they had a park and recreation program, a trails program, economic development program. Um, uh, 
and one more, which I'm forgetting right now, unfortunately. Uh, oh, a bidding program. Uh, so uh, you could do online bids. Um, what's occurred over the last, uh, particularly the last 10 years, is most of those programs have kind of fallen by the wayside as the private sector stepped up and provided alternatives that either work better or is more functional. Um, and so most of the investment that's occurred is in mybuildingpermit.com. And so uh, last January of 20, or this January, 2017, um, the board decided to kind of repurpose and refocus the organization that uh, would be more appropriate to our bread and butter program, which is the mybuildingpermit.com. Uh, and so as a result of that, we decided to relook at the ILA uh, interlocal agreement, which is between um, all the various partners, and there are six um, uh, as part of this, and came up with, uh, in partnership with the Pacifica Law Group, which is the group that, the law group that um, provides legal services for eGov, um, we came up with kind of three primary areas of changes in the ILA. And the ILA, along with the uh, edits, are included in your packets. Um, so the first one is, uh, uh, from a governance standpoint, this, there was a board, and then there was an operations board, and then each of the uh, units, uh, programmatic units, had uh, a separate board that was kind of an advisory board. And so the advisory boards would meet, they'd uh, provide their recommendation to the ops board, the ops board would, you know, uh, modify that or work through that, and then they provide a recommendation to the board. Um, really what's happened since we moved to mybuildingpermit.com, the building inspectors of those programs are really the kind of the advisory board or the management team of the building permit program. And so um, there really, we've discovered there really isn't a need for an ops operations board anymore. And so that, um, that management uh, team uh, reports directly to the board at this point. And so uh, the first substantive change to the ILA is that all uh, references to the operations board are removed. So they uh, haven't met since uh, 2016. Um, so they're really just a non-functional um, you know, part of the structure. The other, uh, the second big change is on the board members. So in the past, um, and we used to have up to eight board members, um, they made uh, the ultimate decisions and then there were also subscribers that were a big part of the program. Um, now that our focus is primarily on uh, eGov, um, we have uh, are recommending changing the board to allow for a subscriber viewpoint so the board could appoint a subscriber um, and they could add some additional subscribers as needed. And the primary reason for that is we've got a couple of really big subscribers, uh, namely King County and Snohomish County that that are part of this now, and they actually pay more a year as a subscriber than we pay and contribute as a board member. And so, you know, from a governance standpoint, they said, well, we're paying all this money, but we don't have a voice on invest future investments and that type of, uh, you know, uh, decisions on the program. So this was really a, as a request of uh, King County and uh, Snohomish County that they have some representation on the board. Um, and then the other piece uh, related to that is it clarifies who the voting representative is. So it is the, uh, the CEO of the organization, so it could be the mayor or the city manager or other equivalent, um, or uh, an appointed representative. So, um, you know, the deputy or, or equivalent. And I think one of the challenges has been um, that some communities were sending uh, IT manager or sometimes lower uh, representatives and they weren't empowered to make decisions and so it just started to gum up the works and the decision making process. Um, and so uh, this clarifies that on those board meetings, which is you know gonna be probably once a quarter, um, that the you know the CEO or CEO or representative would actually be the one who has to attend those meetings. And then the last item is on the cost allocation. So previously the cost allocation was based on population um, for the board members and then uh, the partners rather and then uh, the uh, subscribers paid a fee based on whatever the overall investment in that annual program was. Um, and then we switched uh, for MBP when that really kind of took effect to uh, a different program based on permit revenue. So the amount of permits and permit revenue that we generate, that ends up uh, 
determining what the uh, annual contribution is for that for that program, which then drives the budget. Uh, you may recall. Uh, we have a technology fee of 5%, um, so 3% of that goes to eGov, and then the balance stays in uh, within the Department for Investments and Technology. And so um, the uh, final uh, recommendation was to change the program uh, to, from a population uh, perspective to a uh, uh, well, to what it calls a depends perspective. So depending on the program, um, it would uh, vary uh, based on, uh, you know, kind of your overall usage of the, of the product. Um, and then lastly, it provides for uh, a provision that uh, what we discovered is um, if a partner member did not want to participate in a program, um, they were under the structure um, of the uh, of the bylaws required to pay that annual contribution anyway. So you may, like uh, Bellevue, moved from uh, this uh, local gov jobs net to um, uh, NeoGov. And so they were essentially, they had their own independent system, yet they were still paying for this uh, for this personnel system that they were no longer using. Um, and now what you look, when you look at the users of that program, um, they're primarily small cities. So um, what it does allow us to do is there may be uh, some smaller partnership arrangements uh, or uh, some other provisions that would allow for those communities who are the most you know, active and primary users to invest and pay the costs on, on that. Um, you know, the alternative previously was if you were a board member and didn't like that or primarily used one program, you had to just cease being a board member and then become a subscriber. And so that was, uh, uh, you know, affecting kind of the long-term uh, finances of the organization. So uh, here we are. This is going to all the various uh, um, agencies that are partners, and um, they've you know run through all the uh, various uh, city attorneys, and um, so if we're good, uh, which you know these aren't substantial changes, then um, we'd recommend uh, approval. Um, and given your agenda, I know the, the committee ultimately makes this decision, but given the agenda on December 18th, you know we would suggest that it go on consent since we don't have much of an option to make any changes anyways because it, it would then require all five other partners that are part of the ILA to go ahead and adopt our changes, which they may or they may not. So um, essentially kind of, it is like the last one, it is what it is, <clears throat> unless we choose not to be a partner anymore. Questions? I have no non-staff people in the audience, so no public comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I I would like to send this back on consent on the 18th. I think it's good that we saw it in committee, but uh, uh, I don't think full council needs to needs to see it. Right? Any uh, okay consent with would be. Yeah. All right, great to owe consent on the 18th. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.